everyone! Welcome to our second webinar in our series about the new Genes in Space Toolkit for this year's competition. My name is Allie, and I'm at Mini PCR Bio, which is one of the founding partners of the Genes in Space competition. In today's webinar, we're going to go briefly over the Genes in Space contest, what it is, how it works, and then we're going to focus on one of the new methods in the Genes in Space Toolkit, the BioBit cell-free reactions. So first, a little bit about Genes in Space. Genes in Space is a free science competition where middle and high school students propose DNA experiments related to space biology. And one of the many great things about Genes in Space is that it's an ideas contest. You don't have to do any experiments, you just need a great idea. And these ideas are really important to think about right now. We're entering a new era of space exploration where things like long-term missions to places like Mars may soon be possible, but there's still a lot we don't know about how space impacts living things. The contest itself is very open. You can propose an idea on any topic, as long as it involves DNA. And the grand prize is pretty cool. Uh, the winning proposal is actually flown to the International Space Station, the ISS, and it's carried out, about, carried out in space by the astronauts there, giving you the opportunity to advance cutting-edge space biology research. As an example, just last month, astronaut Dr. Kate Rubens performed the winning experiment from the 2019 Genes in Space contest. The winners, Finsa Miyuji, proposed an experiment that investigated how microgravity impacts the function of the nervous system, and we can't wait to see what the results end up being. And applying to Genes in Space is pretty easy. First, you identify an open research question related to space biology, What's something that hasn't been studied in space before? Then you formulate a hypothesis. What do you think might happen when your chosen question or your idea in space? And then you develop an experimental plan to test your hypothesis that uses at least one of the methods in the Genes in Space Toolkit to study DNA. And the last thing you need to do is to justify why your experiment needs to be conducted on the ISS. The contest actually just opened last week. You can already start applying through the Genes in Space website. The electronic application form is now available and you can submit your application anytime between now and April 12th. And this year, the Genes in Space Toolkit has expanded to include three ways to carry out a DNA experiment on the ISS. Again, your proposed experiment just has to use one of these tools, but it could definitely use more than one. Uh, we're doing a whole series of webinars to help you get familiar with all these different elements in the new toolkit. Uh, a few weeks ago, we did a webinar covering PCR. If you missed that, the link to the recording of that webinar will be down below in the, in the description. Uh, but today, we'll be covering the BioBits cell-free system, and then in a few weeks, on February 17th, you can learn about the P51 fluorescent viewer. All right, let's get into it. So the BioBit system is an easy alternative way of making proteins. So in this webinar, first uh, we'll review what proteins are and why they are useful. Then we'll go over how proteins are made. And then finally, I'll go over how a, what a cell-free system is and how it can be used to make proteins more easily in space. So, when you hear the word protein, you might imagine a chunk of meat. And yes, meat is composed of certain types of protein, but proteins actually come in many different forms and do many different things. You can think of proteins like all the different tools in your body, you, your body needs to keep you alive. These include proteins that break down the food we eat, proteins that carry oxygen through our blood, or proteins like these blue little antibodies shown here that help fight off viruses and infections. The proteins made in our bodies are important for keeping us alive, but sometimes scientists want to make proteins outside of the body because they can be really useful tools in a lot of different settings. Because this is a genes in space webinar, let's think about a hypothetical long-term mission to Mars. All right, so imagine a scenario where, say, a year or two 
into the mission, one of the astronauts develops diabetes, which means that their body can't make the protein insulin anymore to help regulate their blood sugar. To help the astronaut, insulin that was made artificially in the lab can be used as a treatment to make up for the lack of insulin in their bodies. Many other diseases similar to this can also be treated as such with other certain proteins. What if, if one astronaut gets really, really sick with a highly contagious virus on board and the other astronauts need to protect themselves from getting infected? In this case, a vaccine might be really useful. Many vaccines have specific proteins in them to help train our bodies to fight against viruses and other infections. And as a final example, uh, what do we do when we get to Mars to set up a place to live and we need fuel for energy? Uh, there are certain types of proteins, actually, that can help perform biochemical reactions to make chemicals like biofuels. And if the astronauts had these proteins, they wouldn't have to take all the fuel they would ever need with them and be able to instead make the fuel they need on Mars. In all of these hypothetical scenarios, uh, they highlight how useful proteins can be, not just inside our bodies, but applied to a lot of different situations. But we can't plan for all these possible scenarios to happen and bring every single protein we might need to Mars. Some situations might require us to make the protein when we need it. So that brings us to uh, how are proteins actually made? So the instructions for making all the proteins in our body are stored in our DNA. It's kind of like cooking. Uh, if the proteins are the food that you're trying to make, then the recipes are found in the DNA. Just like each unique recipe makes a unique dish, we have these segments in our DNA called genes. Uh, each gene contains the instructions for making a unique protein, such as the insulin gene here containing the instructions for making the insulin protein. All these different genes, all these different recipes make up our DNA like one giant cookbook. And this is happening in our bodies all the time. Specific, specific proteins are being made from the instructions in specific genes. Today, we're not going to go over the exact steps of how this is done, but I did cover that topic in a previous webinar I did about the central dogma, which you can check out in the link in the description if you're interested in more details here. Instead, we're going to focus on, um, you know, that that's how our bodies are able to make proteins, but how are scientists able to do this outside of the body in a lab setting? All right, let's go back to our example where we want to make insulin for our astronauts with diabetes. To make insulin, scientists first takes the gene that encodes for insulin and inserts it into living cells. These living cells are typically bacteria, although cells from other different types of organisms can be used too. And these living cells are used as kind of like a factory to produce the protein we want. So scientists will grow a bunch of these cells, these little mini factories that we're using, up in a liquid culture. Uh, if you've ever done this in your classroom before, you probably grew cells in a little test tube or a beaker. Uh, but pharmaceutical companies usually grow these cells in these huge tanks. And as these cells grow and divide, they will also take the DNA instructions we gave them, follow the instructions encoded by the DNA, and make the insulin. We then harvest or extract insulin from the cells, and then we have the protein we can use to treat our astronaut with diabetes. Uh, except there is one big problem with this scenario, literally big. Uh, I mentioned that scientists usually need to grow these cell cultures up in these huge tanks. And you can imagine, not only is this expensive, so this whole thing here in this picture is this giant tank, uh, but all this equipment is really heavy and takes up a lot of space. All of this definitely would not fit very well on the ISS, for example, or say on our spaceship to Mars. And plus, knowing how to use all of this equipment and grow the cells can also be pretty difficult. Uh, many astronauts don't have the scientific training or background to be able to make proteins like this. But there is a way to make proteins without using living cells. And this is known as a cell-free system because it's free of any living cells. So 
Instead of this living bacteria cell shown here, scientists can actually extract all the parts needed to make proteins. Again, I'm not going to go over what these exact parts are today, but they're shown at these little squiggly shapes here. And all you need to know for now is that scientists can combine these extracted parts, the little machines for making proteins, with some ingredients for making proteins and put that all in a tube. We don't have to worry about having giant tanks or other big expensive equipment to do so. And this is really exciting because it's a lot easier to fly this little tiny tube up to the ISS or out to Mars than a giant liquid culture tank. So cell-free systems have been around for a while now, and even though you no longer need those giant tanks to grow cells, you still need to keep cell-free reactions super, super cold, like in one of those giant ultra-low temperature freezers. That would be difficult to keep the cell-free reaction cold enough on the ISS, but recently scientists actually have found a way to make these reactions more stable so they don't have to be kept cold. This is known as a process called freeze drying, and we actually do this to food being sent up to astronauts on the ISS. So imagine an astronaut at the ISS really wants an ice cream cone. If you try to stick this ice cream cone in a bag and send it up without keeping it cold, it's going to melt and go bad before it even leaves Earth. But what we can do is we can take this ice cream, freeze it solid, and then put it in a special machine called a lyophilizer or freeze dryer and this machine will suck out all the water in the ice cream until all you're left with is solid. Now it won't melt, it won't go bad, and the astronaut can enjoy their freeze dried ice cream on the ISS. We can do the same to these cell free reactions. Freeze them solid and then suck out all the water until all we're left with are these little solid yellow pellets you see in this picture here at the bottom of these tubes. When I refer to the BioBits cell free system, these little freeze dried pellets are what I'm talking about. Now, these are stable at room temperature and we can more easily ship them up to the International Space Station without worrying about keeping them too cold. And when they get to the ISS, the astronauts won't have to worry about them staying cold until they need to use them to make proteins. So let's go back again to our long-term mission to Mars with our astronaut with diabetes. To make insulin as a treatment, we just take the cell-free pellet, which again is shown here, and again this contains all of the machinery and the materials to build the protein, add the DNA, which again contains all the instructions for building the protein, mix it all up, and inside the tube the insulin gene is providing the instructions to all these materials and machinery to make the insulin protein. And once it's made, we can pull out the insulin and treat our astronaut. So, with BioBits, these freeze-dried cell-free reactions, you can add water and DNA and make proteins. And this will be available as part of this year's toolkit. So, we challenge you to think, what protein do you want to make in space? Uh, there are so many different types of proteins with so many different uses. Maybe you want to make a protein that treats a disease, kind of like insulin. Maybe you want to make a protein that performs an important chemical reaction. Uh, to end, I wanted to give one more example of a useful application of how proteins can be used. It's a bit advanced, but I'll try to explain it clearly. All right, so water quality testing is something that's very important both here on Earth as well as in space. Astronauts have a limited water supply and have to recycle their water over and over again. So it's really important for them to know that their recycled water is still good. And there are potential, a lot of potential contaminants in water from metals or drugs like antibiotics. And a cell-free test, like the BioBit system, would work well for water quality testing in the field, including in space. Scientists have designed a system where you can add a water sample to a cell-free reaction and a clear color change will indicate the presence of a specific, specific contaminant. Let's zoom in a little bit to see how this works. The cell-free reaction contains a sensor that activates making a protein from a gene only when it senses a contaminant. So, 
If the contaminant is in the water, then the system, the sensor triggers, and then the gene used to make a protein uh, is activated. The trick is, is that this gene encodes an enzyme protein that helps convert a colorless chemical into a colored one. So when we zoom in on the yellow tube here, we see that the protein leads to the production of a yellow color. So when we see our tube turn yellow, we know that the water quality, the water sample that we added contained the contaminant. And if we add the water and we don't see a color change, then we know the water is clean. This thing here can be used on Earth, but also in space to confirm that the astronaut's water supply is still good. And this is just one example of how using a cell-free system to make proteins can be useful in space. There are so many different untapped ideas out there, and we can't wait to hear what you all come up with. So I wanted to jump into some uh, Q&A now. A lot of you submitted questions ahead of time, so I'll answer them now. Um, can my proposal use more than one of the genes in space toolkit techniques? I talked about BioBits today, uh, but we did cover a webinar on PCR previously, as well as we'll cover the P51 viewer in a few weeks. Um, and yes, you can use more than one elements of the toolkit, uh, depending on what idea you want to explore. Uh, some of these techniques might actually work really well together. And we'll talk a little bit about, more about this um, in a few weeks at our P51 webinar. So for the first time ever, the 2020 Genes in Space Finals actually took place remotely, which raises the question of whether or not this will also be the case this year. And the answer is yes. The finals for the 2021 contest will be virtual. The presentations uh, from the 2020 finalists actually are available online, and we actually encourage you to check out those amazing presentations to get more exposure to the different questions that these students asked for space biology research. Will the toolkits be provided by Genes in Space, or do we have to buy them? And no, again, remember, Genes in Space is an ideas contest, which means you just have to write out and explain your idea and submit it. You don't need to do any experiments to back it up or anything like that. If you do end up winning, we will work with you to make your experiment a reality, but as for the contest itself, it's free to enter, and you don't need to buy anything. Uh, is Genes in Space available to students and teachers living outside of the U.S.? Um, the Genes in Space contest itself is only open to students attending school in the U.S., but both the Genes in Space resources and the mini PCR bio resources that I'll talk about briefly in a bit here are free to everyone worldwide. And webinars like today's webinar will remain on YouTube indefinitely, uh, so you can go out and check those out if you still want to use these resources in your classroom. Finally, a science-based question. Um, what do we do once we make the protein with the cell-free reaction? Uh, so once we do make the protein, we still need to separate the protein from the rest of the reaction. We can't just take that reaction and inject it straight into someone if they need the insulin, for example. Um, this process is actually called protein purification. And there's a lot of different ways that protein purification can work to isolate the protein away from the rest of the reaction so it's pure and clean and ready to use. But we're not going to go into that today. All right, so I'm going to wrap up with a rundown of some of the logistics for entering genes in space. Again, the contest is open to those who live in the US and are in grades 7 through 12. Students can submit an application on their own or work together in teams of up to four students. Uh, applications must list the name and the contact information for a teacher, parent, or other adult to sponsor their application. And again, the application deadline for this year's contest is April 12th. So there's plenty of time between now and then to work on a proposal. And I want to emphasize one more time that it's completely free to apply, so anyone can enter. I'm going to say it again. Again, the contest is open now and closes on April 12th. Uh, the awardees, the semifinalists, and the finalists are announced throughout the month of May. And then after that, uh, the finalists are paired with scientists who serve as mentors to help refine their research proposals. 
And then in July, the finalists will present their research to a panel of judges who will then select the winning experiment to be launched into space the next year. And there are tons of free resources we have available online to help you with your application. You can check out all these resources at this uh, website here, genesinspace.org slash learn. There, you're going, to be, you're going to be able to find videos explaining biotechnology like PCR and DNA sequencing, as well as interviews with scientists conducting space biology research. For example, Dr. Massa here describing her research focuses on growing plants in space for long distance missions. What DNA experiments can you think of uh, related to growing food in space? You'll also find genes in space application tips, including the detailed sco scoring criteria. And again, don't forget the genes in space toolkit has been expanded this year. In addition to PCR, which again we covered in a previous webinar, you may now propose experiments that also use the Biobit cell free system that was covered today and or the P51 fluorescent viewer. If you missed the webinar on PCR a few weeks back, the recording is on YouTube. Again, link is down in the description. And we're going to cover P51 in a webinar on February 17th, so stay tuned for that. And I just wanted to thank everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. And we're really excited to see all your applications for the 2021 Jeans in Space contest.